but uh, wanted to bring your attention back to something that Tony Bukert mentioned. Tony, in passing, didn't spend a lot of time on it, but you may have noticed he spent in passing a comment about a group of men called the Black Robe Regiment. The Black Robe Regiment. And that kind of struck me rather curious because, frankly, I never heard of them. And admittedly, I was kind of caught off guard and got my curiosity kind of uh, started up. And looking into it, I decided I was going to spend some time and review just who these guys were. What, what are they known for? Who are they? What did they do in their involvement with the Revolutionary War, of all things, because Tony put them in that time slot, in that timeline, and in that context? So I wanted to talk a little bit about them, but in context with, with uh, what I want to present. So let me, before I go ahead and formally introduce you to these guys, let me digress for a moment and introduce you to a guy uh, who's named Charles Finney, of all things. Charles Finney. Now, Charles Finney was, interestingly enough, a former lawyer. He had a practice going, but he quit. He got struck by God, came to, as they would say, his meet Jesus moment, and decided to go ahead and uh, involve himself with evangelism and became known, really, as uh, what was the father of evangelism of the Second Awakening during that early part to mid part of the 19th century. And of all things, get this, he turned out to be a professor, he started out over in New York, made a real big name for himself around 1825 and so forth, 1830, 1835. He moved over to just a few miles down the road here to Oberlin, Ohio, of all things, and became a professor there in Oberlin College. Later on, ultimately became the president of Oberlin College for about 15 years or so later in his life. But he was also known to be the first pastor of the um, Congregational Church there in uh, Oberlin and was somewhat disgruntled over the Presbyterian Church because he was a Presbyterian minister by trade. That was the denomination that he really affiliated with. He was a Presbyterian. But he was kind of disgruntled with them. And frankly, they were a little disgruntled with him because of his flamboyant ways of preaching and his evangelistic style of talking and the way he came across with some of the things that he spoke about, doctrinally speaking even, uh, he kind of crossed some lines and so forth, but more so because of his flamboyant way and style of speaking. As a matter of fact, he really set the stage for guys like D.L. Moody and Billy Sunday and Billy Graham of sort uh, later on in the 20th century uh, of these guys. Now, this guy was a ZZ Top bearded fellow. <laughs> he was one of these long uh, beard guys, you know, kind of bald-headed kind of like me now, I guess. <laughs> but, but he was, uh, he was uh, what you could say, a, a real mover and shaker, as, uh, as the saying goes. And I wanted to take a, a moment here to just quote something that he said that I think is very important for all of us to recognize, especially in the day and age that we're in, because, frankly, a lot of what Mr. Charles Finney talked about has been forgotten over many of the years, decades, and now you could make the case a good century plus. And it's sad. What Mr. Finney said was this. We need more of the Boanerges, that is, or the Sons of Thunder. We need more James and Johns. Remember them? They were the guys that said, Jesus, these people don't like you. Let's call fire down from heaven and just burn them. That was their attitude. You know. These were the sons of thunder. They were uh, impetuous. They were sometimes not as patient. These guys were roughnecks. The 12 disciples were what you could say blue-collar workers for the common man. They were fishermen. Peter, I'm sure, was known for his mouth. He wasn't what you could say the most di diplomatic and tactful kind of character that you'd run into and would have some choice words for you if he had a difference with you, for sure, without a doubt. My point is, he said, that is Mr. Finney, 
He says, we need more of these sons of thunder in the pulpit. If Satan rules in our halls of legislation, the pulpit is responsible for it. Woo. He goes on. If our politics become so corrupt, Mr. Comey, Mr. Clinton, Mr. McCabe, if they become so corrupt, if our politics do, that the very foundation of government are ready to fall away as Portland burns and Seattle burns and New York burns, the pulpit, the pulpit, the ministry of Jesus Christ, as far as Mr. Finney is concerned, is responsible for it. Unquote. Now, why would you think he would say such a thing? I want you to think about that. Because, you see, the fact of it is, we ourselves are seeing our country changing, are we not? Right before our eyes. The United States of America, brethren, if you haven't noticed by looking around the world, is the last bastion of freedom. It is the last safe place for assured human rights. Now, some people might debate me on that, but I'm speaking in general as I take opportunity to do a fair side-by-side -side in other parts of the world. And I will use that as, a, as a, just a, a general reference because the fact of it is I don't see anybody breaking their neck to move to Kenya. I don't see anybody breaking their neck to get over to Iceland. But I see everybody breaking their neck to get into the United States of America. Why? Because it was looked upon as the promised land. It was looked upon as the new world. But today, brethren, we have leaders in our roles of leadership and politics, namely people like Alexandria, uh, Cortez, Ilhan Omar, I'm calling names because we need to be aware of names. Rashida Talib, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, self acclaimed socialists. Uh, bear with me because I want to take you through some development here and introduce you to some preamble for context so you can follow me on where I'm going with this. Because Mr. Finney was on to something. Without a doubt, he was on to something. And I submit to all of us, brethren, the reasons for certain things occurring today and the laws and legislation that have been passed over the years and decades in our lifetime, my lifetime, and I'm not that old, but in my lifetime, have changed drastically. When I was a teenager, there was no such thing as two men marrying, marrying each other. Now it's a national law. When I was a mid-twenties or so person, never in my wildest dreams would I see it to be legalized to kill babies, and now even to the point where after they're born, just leave it on the table. It'll die on its own. How macabre. Do you know what Mr. Finney was doing? He was talking to slavery. He was talking up the ab abolitionists. He wanted slavery eliminated. <gasps> but that's a political issue. You can't talk about slavery. Back in that day, back in the 1800s. That's political. No, it's not. It's moral. It's been politicized, but that doesn't mean it's politics. It was politicized. Abortion, homosexual marriages, transgenderism, name them on and on and on, you can go. But that doesn't mean you can't address them, and they shouldn't be addressed. And what Mr. Charles Finney was after was he's looking for the Johns and James who are not afraid to address the issues at hand and call them out because his case is, is that if 
the pulpits were doing that, brethren. We may not have what we have today in all due respect to the condition of our country and our cities burning and people not respecting the rule of law and now are attempting to even push the envelope even further by developing a socialist platform to replace the Constitution. There's even some who want to change the national anthem to something else. You have all of the sports now taking knees, which is so out of context. That may not be politically correct to say, but what does that have to do with the Cleveland Browns or the Cleveland Indians or the New York Yankees? As it's been said over and over, you've got problems with social justice. Take your millions, develop a foundation, and do something. It's amazing, brethren, how much, much things are changing here in Ohio. And perhaps this is what's a little bit gotten under my skin to motivate me to go along this line and to review these black robe regiment guys. Who are they? We'll get back to that in a moment. But here on July 23rd, I think it was about 6 uh, o'clock in the evening in Ohio, we were mandated, mandated, not law, not yet, but mandated to wear masks, unless you're officiating. <laughs> Religious services, officiating. Religious services, you get a pass. But it doesn't make sense. It does not make sense. I went and got a haircut, if you haven't noticed. I went and got a haircut. Walked into the barbershop, didn't have a mask. They told me I had to have a mask to get in to get my hair cut. I had to go back out to my car because I'm not used to carrying a mask. I went and got my mask. Went in. They said I had to wear the mask as long as I'm sitting and waiting. I got to wear the mask. Okay, I'm going to wear the mask. I wore the mask. I waited for about 20 minutes or so. Finally got called to the barber chair. When I got to the barber chair, I didn't have to wear the mask. I had to take the mask off. How does that make sense? I wasn't in a bubble. I was just sitting in a barber chair. I was about 10 feet away from where I was sitting in the chair waiting for my haircut. What was the difference? Nothing. My wife went down along with my children. I had some th other things to do I couldn't make. I went down for a family reunion in Orlando a few weeks back. Try to walk into a restaurant. They had to put a mask on to walk from the door to the table. But once they got to the table, they could take the mask off. I was down in the flats with my son-in-law and my granddaughter and Margie and I. We went to a, a restaurant to try to get in to have dinner. And we were told we had to put a mask on again, like in Florida, to go to the table. But once we got to the table, we could take the mask off. Didn't make sense. No logic. Where's the science behind some of this? What is it with respect to some of these things that brethren we're dealing with now and of which are indeed imposing themselves upon us? I recently, this week as a matter of fact, was sent another quote from one of our members in New York, state of New York. He sent it to me and he said this. He said, Bill, have you heard about this? And he emailed it to me. If you're watching... I hope you're uh, okay and everything is doing uh, fine over there at your house there, uh, Ray. But I wanted to mention this. Have you heard about this, he wrote. A family member returned to church this week, and the first thing, now this is in New York, the first thing they were required to do is to provide names, addresses, phone numbers, which is to be sent to the CDC, this will be done every week for one year to each member. What's your address? What's your phone number? How many people living in your house? How many kids do you have? How many are under 16? And we're going to do this every week. We've got to, we're going to have a, 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 a board, you know, a clipboard downstairs. When you come in, you've got to sign in. Oh, I'm Bill Watson. I'm living with my wife. She's female, by the way. I only have one. And... <laughs> 
Where are we going, brother? It would be funny. Wouldn't it be funny if it wasn't so sad? America, freedom to travel, freedom to walk, freedom to breathe fresh air, drink clean water. America, you don't protect it, you're going to lose Manasseh, prophetically speaking. It's coming. The storm is here. And brethren, it's really upon us. He says, I don't know about this being done in a mosque. <laughs> yeah, I don't either. <laughs> any mosques doing this? And any other religious organization? Is CGI being required to do this? No. <laughs> no. We're not going to require to be doing it. Before that, I would say nobody should come anymore. I'm not interested in collecting data for whoever, including the Chinese and artificial intelligence. That's all it's about. It's about data, 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 data. Collecting that data for the purpose of manipulation. Don't sell it short, brethren, in so many respects because it is indeed... It is indeed uh, information that can be used for nefarious purposes. We've got states now, like the state of New York, that if you come in from Florida, you've got to automatically go into a 14-day quarantine. Amazing. Amazing uh, in some of these uh, particular situations where we are being told that we have to quarantine the healthy. My Bible says over in... Numbers chapter 5, verse 2 and 3. I'm not turning there for the sake of time because I'm on a fast track here. Numbers, write it down. Numbers, you look it up. 5, verses 2 through 3. Or the whole chapter of Leviticus, chapter 13. Your Bible says you quarantine the sick. <laughs> not the healthy. If you're sick, you got sniffles, you got, you got cough, you got aches, you got something going on and you know you've got it going on because you're symptomatic. Stay home. Be considerate. Don't come and expose other people to your sickness that you know you have, especially. You quarantine the sick, your Bible says, in this respect, because the fact of it is, is that that's the right thing to do. However, we have this premise, we have this predicate that's being pounded into your brain and into my brain to think that this is true. And that is that when you're asymptomatic, meaning you have no symptoms, you have no cold, you have no cough, you have no sneeze, you have no ache, you have no problem. I had a knee operation here a couple of weeks ago on my meniscus. I had to get it repaired. I had to go into the hospital. Before I went to the hospital, I had to get a test for this CCP, this the Communist, Chinese Communist Party virus. I had to get that checked to make sure I could go into the hospital because I wouldn't be allowed to go get my, my uh, operation. The girl stuck a thing up my nose and took it and burned. Boy, that burned. I don't know what they got on the end of those tips, but uh, it burned. I asked her if I could just spit in since, since I, you know, wearing masks uh, are supposed to stop the virus, meaning that if I am carrying the virus, I ought to be able to spit on a Petri dish or on a, on, a, on a cloth, and you could take the sample from the spit. She said, she looked at me like, well, I'll take the mask off. I wasn't wearing a mask, but I'm just saying, the mask is supposed to stop it, so if you take the mask off, it won't stop it, you just spit. It'd be much, much more comfortable than that thing up your nose. But guess what? I was asymptomatic. I told her I felt good, had no headache, wasn't coughing. Don't have any aches and uh, uh, pains or anything other than my meniscus. But she, she still had to take the test. And guess what? Came back negative. Well, imagine that. Wasn't a surprise because I was asymptomatic. You see, the theory is, the theory, operative theory, theory is that you're asymptomatic, you're a carrier. You're a carrier. And consequently, as a result, are a high risk 
of infecting other people. In other words, even if you're asymptomatic, you could be, may be infectious. But according to the World Health Organization, who, 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 says this from Dr. Marie Van Karkhove. Karkhove. She said this just a few days ago. Quote, we are constantly looking at the data, trying to get more information from countries who truly answer this question. Is it still, or it still appears, that is, it still appears to be rare that an asymptomatic individual actually transmits onward. Unquote. In other words, they're still not sure. And if indeed it does happen, it's very rare. And of course it could be rare because you might be in a different stage of the contamination or of the infection and still may not be. But with that being said, brethren, this predicate, this predicate that you are infectious because you uh, are a still asymptomatic, is highly suspect, needless to say, highly suspect for this, what you could say, uh, transmission of uh, this disease from one person to another. And the N95 respirators, the masks that you carry, I don't know how many of you are aware of this. Again, I'm speaking from 30 years of experience in filtration. That's, what, that's my background. I was basically a design engineer for water treatment systems that dealt with bacteria, pyrogenic material, and viruses. That's all we did day in and day out, as well as other industrial applications. But a lot of our business was in the pharmaceutical industry, the hemodialysis industry in uh, what you could say infectious environments such as surgery and central supply in different hospitals and laboratories for lab work. That's what I did. I designed and developed and built systems that purified fluids so that those applications would be credible for the production of whatever commodity was being produced. And sometimes lives were on, on the line. If I would have walked into a doctor who's only opening up a dialysis unit in the design of my system and I told him, well, Dr. Uh, uh, you know, Dr. Walker, I'm, I'm going to use a five micron filter and a one micron filter and that'll get rid of all of your, uh, your viruses. We'll put the white, one micron on the return side and we'll put the five micron on the, on the pre-side and that way we'll, we'll be sure to get it. He would take me by the seat of my pants and throw me out the door. He'd throw me right out the door because he knows very well that a virus being down around zero point, on the opposite side now of the decimal, one, two, five micron, from compared to 1.0 to higher, 5.0 micron, would not in any way, shape, or form keep a bug going from uh, a distance, no more than a chicken fence would stop a mosquito. It's just not good science. Brethren, if you have secondary diseases, I get all of that. I get all of that. And certainly if you feel more comfortable with a, a mask, I get all that too. I've got no problem with people wearing masks. Don't get me wrong. I've got no problem. If you choose to wear a mask, wear it. Where my problem is, is don't force me to wear one. When I know, when I know in my mind, my conscience, that it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, and especially an N95, which has the exhale port with no filtration, meaning when you exhaust, goes out, it's a free port. There's no filtration. You got filtration coming in, yeah, but you got nothing going out. So what's going on? What's going on, brother? What do you see? You must answer these questions yourselves. Look around you. See what's going on. Understand that we have a country that is indeed slipping 
away. Wake up. The storm is upon us. Let me bring you full circle. We're, go we're going to move back toward the birth and genesis of this country, brethren. Eventually we'll get there, and we're going to talk about these black robe guys. Be patient with me. I want to take you back now to James Madison, our second president of the United States. He said this, late 1700s, late 1700s, he said this, our second president. We have, quote, we have staked the whole of our political institution upon the capacity of mankind for self-governance, upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves, to control ourselves, to sustain ourselves, get this, according to the Ten Commandments, unquote. Wow. The Constitution of the United States, the amendments, bills of rights, assurances of yours and my human rights that this nation provides to all of us as God-given rights, not government-given rights. God-given rights is important for you on the Internet and wherever you may be listening to us here in this room as it resonates, I would hope, around the world that we are a free people to make choices and to govern ourselves. The premise of this country, the experiment, if you want to call it that, was to develop and design a republic that would provide the freedom environment, a free expression of self-control, ensconced, framed, bordered by the Ten Commandments. We have forgotten that. Why do I know? Let me introduce to you the book Rules for Radicals, A Pragmatic Primer for Realistic Radicals by Saul Alinsky, one of Hillary Clinton's mentors, heroes, and President, former President Obama. And I'll show you something very clearly here in a moment with regards to the realities of what you and I are now seeing play out knowing full well this man, Saul Alinsky, who died in 1972 and wrote this book of which Hillary Clinton, when she was in college, adored this man, gave her the impetus, information, world outlook on writing her book, It Takes a Village. It Takes a Village to move the world toward using the United States and all of its wealth toward a new world order of globalism. As we, the American governments, both Republican and Democrats, independents, I'm not, again, brethren, no party politics here. Policy, 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 policy. We're talking policy. You're going to hear the policies of the new socialist platform. Here they are, number one. They have the guns. These are quotes right out of his book. They have the guns, and therefore we are for peace and for reformation through the ballot, through voting. Get control of the voting because that is how we're going to get it to this point. Quote, he goes on. When we have the guns, then it will be through the bullets, unquote. Quote, out of the book, control health care 
and you control the people. It's in the book. These are policies. These are policies, brethren, that you need to get familiar with because that's what you're seeing play out. National health care, no choice. It's provided to you by the government. Oh, you're 75 years old, you don't need that operation. Go home and die. What would stop them from doing that in making their selective choices for the purpose of saving money on their budgets in health care? Nothing. When you think about it, if you think it through, why is that so important? Because if you control the health care of the people, you control the people. That's the Saul Alinsky item and platform. Goes on here. Listen to this. Quote, the organizer's first job, that is the community organizer's first job, that those that are taking up this platform, this banner, these items, the organizer's first job, I'm quoting now, is to create the issues or problems. Create them. If you don't have them, create them. How do you do that? False flags. Start something. Do something on purpose. Create it out of thin air. Make it look like it's an issue when it isn't an issue. Back to quoting. And organizations must be based on many issues. The organizer must first rub raw the resentments of the people of the community, fan the latent hostilities of many of the people to the point of overt expression. He must search out controversy and issues, gun control, abortion, health care. He must search out controversy and issues rather than avoid them. For unless there is controversy, people are not concerned enough to act. The organizer must stir up dissatisfaction and discontent. So what do you see? You see immigrations. And here just last year, did we not? We saw thousands, thousands of people coming up from Mexico to the United States to kind of bull rush the borders of the United States, the southern borders. And you saw ambulances and, and school buses and people carrying water for all of these illegal immigrants or these migrants that are coming up. And you scratch your head, or at least I hope you were scratching your head. Who's paying for the water? Who's paying for the buses? Who's paying for the ambulances that were following all of those thousands up north to the American border? Who was doing that? Did you ever think of that? I'll tell you who was doing that. The globalists were doing that. People like George Soros in his Open Society Foundation. These people that hate this country. They don't want the United States anymore to exist. It is a stumbling block and an obstacle in preventing globalists to achieve their agenda. And their agenda is so underscored and so based on some of these particular items within the now socialist party. Again, I'm not talking party so much other than to direct your attention on where this platform, this policy resides. And it's important that you understand that so that you can begin now to see clearly how did all this happen? Who's telling these people to do this? Why do they think that this will work? What is it that they're doing in terms of their plan of action that causes them to break windows, to create havoc, anarchy, and so on? Have you noticed lately, by the way, that there are men and women in black on some of the footage you're seeing this last week? These are Antifa, Black Lives Matter people. Oh, yeah, by the way, the NFL is donating $250 million to Black Lives Matter over the next 10 years. And Black Lives Matter is a known socialist organization directed, designed, and developed to tear down everything that the United States of America, Manasseh, prophetically speaking, stands for. But we just eat our popcorn and just watch as we just give away and sit down and concede. Brethren, it's important it's important that we begin to understand some of these things. I could go on and on. Never let a crisis go to waste. Did you ever hear that one? How about that? Never let a crisis go to waste. That came out of the book. That came out of this book written years ago. Years ago. The despair is there. Now it's up to us, quoting, to go in and rub raw the sores of discontent, galvanize them for radical social change. Uh, the very first radical known to man who rebelled against establishment and did it so effectively that he at least won his own kingdom, Lucifer. 
It's in the book. It's Luciferian in its orientation. It's demonic in its design, brethren. This is a spiritual battle as much as it is a physical battle, as much as it is a political and secular battle for the control of the country, your families, and your freedom. In the beginning, the organizer's first job is to create the issues or problems. Now, here's a good one. And this is why I say Obama, former President Obama, is indeed a follower of Saul Alinsky. Quote, I'm quoting, Organization for Action will now in, now and in the decade ahead, center upon America's white middle class. White middle class. Oh, prejudicial? <laughs> Listen. That is where the power is. Our rebels, our, the socialists, our rebels have contemptuously rejected the values of the white middle class. We have contemptuously, contemptuously rejected the white middle class. And I'm just trying to emphasize this so you understand the impact. That's all I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to scare you, but I want you to understand this is a real book that's being really followed by what you're seeing play out around our cities here in the United States that's developing and manifesting anarchy, brethren. And it goes on. He says, our rebels have contemptuously rejected the values and the way of life of the middle class. They have stigmatized it as materialistic, decadent, degenerate, imperialistic, warmongering, brutalized, and corrupt. I'm still quoting. They are right, but we must begin from where we are if we are to build power for change. And the power and the people are in the middle class majority. The power uh, in the people, that is in this particular case, is in the middle class majority is what we're uh, reading here in this uh, uh, segment of his uh, book, Saul Alinsky's book. Now, remember I started this quotation out, Organization for Action. Former President Obama, back in 2008, as an additional initiative, started a sideline business, a foundation, a nonprofit, 501C. It was labeled, uh, what you could say, um, Organization for America. But then later on, it was changed to Organization for Action. Today, it stands as the OFA, Organization for Action. That name was taken right out of Saul Alinsky's book. Right out of his book. And we read, and I'm quoting from Wikipedia, on behalf of now what President, former President Obama's Organization for Action is. It's a nonprofit 501c organization and community organizing project that advocates for the agenda of former U.S. President Barack Obama. The organization is officially nonpartisan, but its agenda and policies are strongly allied with the Democratic Party. It is the successor of Obama's 2012 reelection campaign and of Organizing for America, which it succeeded Obama's 2008 campaign. Founded after Obama's reelection, the group seeks to mobilize supporters in favor of Obama's legislative priorities. OFA is a registered 501c organization, which may advocate for legislation, but is prohibitive uh, from specifically supporting political candidates. We need to wake up, brethren. We need to wake up. There is an actual movement going on amongst us that is indeed hijacking our country right from out from underneath us in this particular uh, case. Uh, one more. Time's running out on me already. Man, I can't believe it. Uh, the first step in community organization is community disorganization. Would you say that Portland and Seattle are right now disorganized? Big time. The disruption of the present organization is the first step toward community organization. How about cultural cancellation? Tear down the statues. Tear down the history of the country. How about that? Let's just take it down. Let's erase it. It never happened. And then also, by the way, pay us back. Pay us back. But nobody ever talks about the 600,000 who died in the Civil War freeing freeing the slaves. What about reparation for them? No one talks about that. I mean, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. It's a two-way street. We all, we all lost things. We all suffered 
through the Civil War, brethren, white and black. We're Americans. We need to lay those swords down, learn from our mistakes so that we don't repeat them, not erase our history so that we might forget it and then run the risk of possibly repeating it. And you know that old adage. So it's important we know our roots. It's important we know where we came from and what we belong to and what it is indeed that is so uh, important to us so that we know what is good and what is bad and what should be preserved and what should be left out. Keep in mind, I hope you're all aware the Nazis were called socialists. I hope you're also aware the Italian fascists in the beginning were called socialists. And the Stalinists, they were also called Stalinists. Russia, Stalinists were called socialists. Again, no party politics. I'm just saying policy. Policy, brethren. Look at what is good for America. How does it align to our republic's constitution, to our original premises, to our original objectives as a republic, as defined by our constitution and our bill of rights and the amendments and so forth and so on? How does it form? How does it support? How does it underscore and reinforce so that your rights and my rights are assured and we are reassured? that they won't be taken away from us because they are God-given. And the only way they can be taken from us is by a tyrannical government, a tyrannical government that would take it from you. That means men taking it from you. God's not going to take it from you. God wants us to be free men and women. We have God-given rights to us. And thankfully for over now almost, well, you could say, make the case almost 400 years, brethren, we have had the benefit of being in a land that was viewed as the new world, a land that was viewed as a promised land in the minds of those original pilgrims that came here from other parts of the world to set up their families and to develop their jobs and societies and who fought and died for this country so that they could preserve it for their children and their children's children for decades to come, for decades to come. And they were willing to sacrifice those particular things for the uh, purpose of preserving, of preserving the nation for the benefit of their children. Ezekiel 3. Ezekiel chapter 3. Verse 17. This is what Charles Finney was upset about. He felt, he felt the pulpits missed this memo. Son of man, I've made you a watchman under the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word of my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, you shall surely die, and uh, you give him not warning. You don't warn him, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked ways to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I'm going to require of your hands. Why? Because you saw the house was burning and you didn't do anything about it. That's why. In other words, man up. Man up. All of us need to man up, the ministry included, and to speak out, brethren, in so many ways to be the watchman. Yet if you warn the wicked and he turn not from his wicked ways nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. Again, when a righteous man does turn from righteousness and commits iniquity and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because you have not given him warning, he shall die in his sin, and his righteousness which he had done uh, shall not be remembered, but his blood, because you didn't warn him that he was falling off the log, I'll require of your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn that righteous man that the righteous don't sin and that does not sin and he shall surely live because he has warned, you have delivered your soul. Brethren, we need courageous people, freedom fighters. Pastors need to not be afraid to speak out on policies that are indeed facing us today in this world that we are now living in. We need to be courageous in the things that we ourselves are speaking about and addressing in all these 
areas uh, that we uh, uh, do indeed find ourselves in. It's so very important, brethren, so very important that we are indeed watchmen and that we do indeed find ourselves responsible to at least when, once we recognize the house is burning to raise our voices up and witness and warn that the house is indeed burning. Ezekiel chapter 33, I'm not going to turn there for the sake of time, but nevertheless certainly does bear our, our attention on again more uh, expose on what the watchman's responsibility is. I would so strongly suggest you go ahead and take some time to read Ezekiel chapter 33 verses 1 through about 20. Very good read and very important read. So, here we are in the time that we are now living in and in the time that we are in fact approaching definite differences that we are now beginning, at least I hope, recognizing. This resistance, this resistance of the black robes and these guys that I was mentioning to you about, their approach toward doing what they were doing uh, and how they were in fact doing it was very important in regards to the timing of their what you could say, involvement in the Revolutionary War. I found it so interesting in exploring who these guys were. Why did the British claim that if indeed they could just kill these guys, arrest them, lock them up, we could win this resistance easily? The resistance being, of course, the Revolutionary uh, War. So they had a vision. And what really underscored their motivation was their vision that the United States of America was indeed a promised land, that it was indeed a new world, that it did indeed represent freedom, freedom, brethren, from the tyranny, the tyranny of the British crown. It was indeed, what you could say, something that they were very motivated by, because they found that the resistance, in their minds anyway, was justified by virtue of the continuation of the crown ratcheting down more control on the colonies. I won't go into a lot of detail, but the Stamp Act, the Sugar Act, the taxing of the tea, remember the Boston Tea Party and so forth, all of those were issues and events that continued to drive many of the patriots during the Revolutionary War finally to call uh, to arms and defend the land from what they felt was an infringement on their rights and freedoms and of which again was the exercising the, as they perceived it to be the exercising of the tyranny of the English crown. The black robes, they were essentially the drum beaters. They were the drum beaters explaining the issues to the people so that they could understand, the people, so the people could understand what was indeed being built, what was indeed being built, Saul Alinsky, policies of socialism, what is indeed being built for a globalist agenda's fulfillment, utilizing a tactic called not invasion, but infiltration infiltrate their schools, infiltrate their entertainment, infiltrate their politics, infiltrate their businesses, corporations, control them, get the policies within these companies, be they entertainment, Disney World, Be they businesses and corporations, Google, Apple, Microsoft, and the CEOs, Bill Gates, and others. Get them infiltrated on our page so that we can begin to make movement. The black robes in their time were the special ops guys, you could say. They were the ones that were in the underbelly of the morality, of the morality 
of the government or of the people, and of course the psychology of the nation. The British, knowing full well that these guys were the mouthpieces attempting to blow their cover and whistle blow what they were doing, because if indeed the people knew what they were building, they could, by virtue of seeing what is going on, the evidence, what is going on, what is brewing. Brethren, what is brewing is even worse. If you can't tell already by what you're seeing and being shown by it playing out is an illustration of what is brewing. And what is brewing is yet more aggression. I fully expect, brethren, I don't know about you, but I fully expect far more worse aggression being played out as the United States grows closer to the election. One thing is for sure, and I'm not saying this is the only reason, but I'm saying it's certainly part of the mix. The globalists do not want this current president of the United States of America reelected. They want this economy shut down. They want things closed up you in your houses, me in my house, and just be quiet while the rioters get away with not wearing masks, out there on the streets, breaking windows just like Crystal Night in 1939 in Poland prior to World War II. It's the same, same plan, brethren, that the socialists have always used, whether it was Hitler or Mussolini. Stalin doesn't matter. Marxists are Marxists. That's what it's all about. And it's time you know where some of this stuff is coming from. Guys like Saul Alinsky and his book, Book for Radicals, or Rules for Radicalization. The black robes, brethren, were the pastors in the churches throughout the colonies. They were the men who were willing to stand up for the rights of the country and do the best they could to try to salvage what was indeed salvageable as the British continued to exercise their agenda of uh, wreaking more control upon their colonies. I want to share some stories with you. I've got a little bit of time. I might go a little bit over time. I, I hope you don't mind, but I, I want to just share these. These stories are just so, so important and I think so interesting uh, for you certainly to uh, share here in being aware of who these guys were. These were pastors, brethren, pastors, ministers of congregations throughout the colonies. They were called the Black Robes Regiment because they wore black robes when they were in the pulpit. The British knew them as, as far as they were concerned, agitators. They were troublemakers. They were mouthpieces that needed to be shut up because they rabble-roused the people and gave the people confidence. They helped the people to understand what was really going on. And thank God the American people and those patriots at that time recognized in time what was indeed going on by the British being who they were and what they were trying to do. Otherwise, this country would be totally different in, in many respects, I'm sure, as it would have been totally different if Hitler would have had his way and if Hirohito would have had his way. We'd be speaking German on the East Coast and Japanese on the West Coast. That's the way it would have been, but thank God again we had his blessings and favor and intervention. I'm quoting, though, some stories. American history, bear with me. The British were only too aware of the power of the pastors in shaping of the public resolve against tyranny and in the people's thirst for freedom. Indeed, when the British troops landed in America, it was the pastors whom they had disparagingly named the Black Robe Regiment because of the black robes that they wore in the pulpit, that they went after first. They went after these pastors first. Dr. David C. Gibbs, president of the Christian Law Association, observed, quote, the colonial pulpit was a major source of strength and inspiration both before and during the Revolutionary War for Independence. In particular, the ministers of New England played a pivotal role in calling for independence and for godly resistance to British tyranny. The pulpits of New England were especially important 
in helping to bring about independence long before the general population understood the threat to American liberty, some colonial ministers saw uh, what was coming and boldly spoke out about it from their pulpits. These men saw themselves as watchmen on the wall. They saw themselves as watchmen on the wall. Beware of Sol Solinsky. Beware of socialistic policies. Beware! If I had a horn and a megaphone, I'd yell it louder so maybe the neighbors could hear it. It's almost enough, brethren, to make you want to go out on the streets and tell everybody. We've got socialism in creeping in on us. As a matter of fact, it's creeped in on us for so long it's a cancer working in our system. And we need to start digging it out. And we are. That's what you're seeing played out because there is a certain recognition of what's been going on and it's painful to watch. Oh, it's painful to watch. Wouldn't you agree it's painful to watch? It's painful to watch. To see this seething cancer, political misnomer called socialism, Marxism, working its way and drilling down into the Constitution to reset itself in a different pattern so that you depend on government for everything. Everything. These guys wanted no part of big government. In the early days of our country, I'm back quoting, the pastors powerfully proclaimed liberty from their pulpits. The Black Robe Regiment stood boldly before the people and called them to throw off tyranny, embrace freedom. John Adams, our second president, rejoiced that the pulpits thundered and lightened every Sabbath, they meant Sunday, of course, against King George's despotism and praised these pastors as being among the most conspicuous, the most ardent and the most influential men of that day in the awakening and revival of American principles and feelings that led to our ultimate independence. Now listen to this story. Listen to this story. The American Revolutionary War began April 19th, 1775. 1775. With the Battle of Lexington and Concord, uh, which were in Massachusetts. The pastor of the church in Lexington, a guy named Jonas Clark, 44 years old, Jonas Clark, he was the pastor. His sermons calling for liberty had been powerful, and he had been urging his members to prepare for war. Indeed, when the smoke of battle cleared that day in Lexington, the American dead in the first battle of the Revolutionary War the American dead, were all from his congregation. Wow. They were all from his congregation. Thus, the first blood had been shed in the cause of liberty, a cause promoted from his pulpit. The teaching of the pulpit of Lexington caused the first blow to be struck for American independence. James L. Adams observed the patriotic preaching of Reverend Jonas Clark primed the guns of battle of Lexington. Samuel Adams, 53 years old, and John Hancock, 38 years old, happened to be with Clark, Jonas, at this time, prior to, of course, that fight. And when it was learned that the British were coming, they asked the pastor if the people of Lexington were ready to fight for their independence. And Clark replied, I've trained them for this very hour. Indeed, when the first shots were fired, Jonas Clark was there with the Minutemen of his congregation taking the battle to the British invaders. One year later to that day, Jonas Clark would declare in his sermon, from this day will be dated the liberty of the world. And it was Paul Revere, Paul Revere, who rode that night, the British are coming, the British are coming. Do you know where he went? To Jonas Clark's home, where John, 
Uh, Hancock was there, and Samuel Adams. Maybe not for drinking a beer, but he was there. <laughs> but he was there. Brethren, these were men, something else. They, they were not afraid to cry aloud, to talk to the issues, to tell the people to repent, spread the word of Jesus Christ in all of your dialogue and in your communications, and help people to see who the bad guys are, who the good guys are. Yeah, guys like Comey, guys like McCabe, guys like Brennan, guys of all these types and sorts, Strzok and his girlfriend Lisa, uh, uh, Page. The, these people, brethren, who broke the law, the evidence is out. These are memos. These are declassified documents for all of you to read on the Internet if you're interested to find out who the bad guys are, who the good guys are. Because indictments, God willing, indictments will come, and these people will be held accountable for what they've done in breaking the laws of our freedom and our open society. And you see, that's what's so vulnerable about our republic. Our Constitution is so free that it's easy to game the system. It's so easy to game the system. Why? As James Madison said, it's predicated on you having enough character to manage yourself. It's trust. It's the fact that the Ten Commandments underscore your behavior. I don't have to worry about you trying to hit on my wife because thou shalt not commit adultery. I don't have to worry about you trying to kill me because it says thou shalt not kill and thou shalt not commit murder. People are being killed in cold blood, brethren. They're being shot right on the street. Even babies are being shot on the street. People are making things up just so that they can have the joy, I guess, or enjoyment of taking a gun and just shooting somebody to see what happens. Never shot anybody. So let me experiment. Wow, that's what it looks like. Because so many of these things that are happening, brethren, are indeed happening because... Our country is not abiding by the Ten Commandments. Over here in Ezekiel chapter 34, as we bring this to a close. Chapter 34, and in verse 1. As we read this, brethren, it's, it's so very, very important that we understand that each and every one of us, as well as the pastorate, as well as the ministry, to raise our voices up, educate our people on the things that we know. Sure, there are things that are still circumstantial. And yes, there are things that we could perhaps put into the category of theory or, as I say, circumstance, circumstantial. But there are also a lot of things that are already proven by virtue of declassified documents that afford you the insight of knowing what laws were breaking by whom. Already, already. Yeah, they haven't been brought to court. Yeah, they yet have not yet been indicted. But let me remind you, the number's gone up, by the way. There's 184,000 sealed indictments. 184,000 sealed indictments right now waiting to be unsealed. As a matter of fact, we just had here in Ohio, we had here in Ohio, you heard the story, I'm sure, last week about six guys. The Speaker of the House in Ohio was caught in a scandal, caught embezzling, $60 million siphoning off your money and my money. You talk about corruption with his six cohorts. I think it was six, maybe five. I don't know how many there were. But some of them that were right up in his group stealing that money and diverting it through First Energy, a corporation. So there was somebody probably in cahoots with that. Somebody had to be winking at this connection to provide dark money to go $60 million into the pocket of the Speaker of the House of the State of Ohio. I'm not making that up. That's fact. He's been indicted. Corruption. And there's far more to come with names, brethren, that are going to make you sweat to realize how deep and how ugly the immorality and Luciferian behavior has been going on for years and decades in entertainment, in politics, it is just disgusting in so many ways. There's a lot more I could say, but I don't have yet the authenticity to speak out on some of these things. But there are some things, brethren, that we can speak out on. And the prophet here in chapter 34 says it very clearly. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. 
prophesy and say unto them, Thus says the Lord unto the shepherds, Woe to you shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. You get rich, fly in your jets, live in your big homes, concerned about your income, concerned about what you're going to eat, money coming in. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Absolutely, brethren, we should be feeding you. We should be teaching you about patience, cognitive dissonance, <laughs> all kinds of things that we should open up the spectrum of discussion and subjects to help you and help ourselves to be better Christians for the representation of the citizenry of which we do represent and never lose your, never lose your focus on that because we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven and we are ambassadors for Christ. And it's important that we always do keep that in mind as pointed out there in Philippians uh, chapter 2, I think it is, verses about 21, 20 uh, through 21. It's important that we recognize always our citizenship is in heaven, representing Christ here on earth. And that's why it's all the more important to feed the flock, feed your relatives, feed your friends. Don't be afraid of their weird looks. Don't be afraid or back uh, up at or recoil from people who think you're nuts for thinking what you're thinking. Use diplomacy. Use tact. Don't come across as a fanatic. But talk to people, brethren. Tell them to look at the policies. Forget the parties. Policy, policy, policy. Does it fit like a piece of the puzzle into our Constitution? Does it fit into the Bill of Rights? Does it fit into preserving your freedoms and your rights, your God-given freedoms, your God-given rights? These Luciferian globalists, brethren, want this country out of the way. Why? For the rise of the beast, the times of the Gentiles. Once America is no longer the balance of power, it's played for the last 400 years, or at least 200 years, the beast will rise. And the times of the Gentiles will be upon us. And you think your rights are being infringed and impinged upon now? You'll be wearing scuba outfits as you walk around the city, let alone a mask on your face. I say that in jest, of course, figuratively speaking. But it's so very important, brethren, to see, and, and time's run out on me, I'm already over time, but I, and I know that, and I apologize for that, but my point here in this particular case is that in verses 1 through about 10, if you read it up through about 10 here in chapter 34, it's so critical, brethren, that all of you read this to understand. We have a responsibility to cry aloud, show, show what is going on, illustrate as best you can to those that you know to help them understand what they should be doing and how uh, they should be doing so that they too are, are informed. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to speak to the issues. Don't be afraid to stand up for your rights. Don't be afraid to add clarity to the things that you know are indeed right because you research them. Once you research them and you get your, yourself the support material and documentation that you know is backing up what you believe, brethren, that's the best way to get confidence. That's the best way to be able to speak with authority about what you're talking about. Be, be ahead. Be, be what you could say plugged in. Be aware of what's going on. Spend your time educating yourself on, I'll say it again, for the, at the risk of belaboring it, policy, policy, policy. Inform yourself on what are the policies that this guy stands for. What does Joe Biden stand for? What does Donald Trump stand for? Open borders on Biden. Close borders on Trump. Okay. I'm going to do a side-by-side -side like wine. Side-by-side. -side. I'm going to draw a line. Side-by-side. -side. Borders. Close them up. Manage them. Borders. Open the floodgates and let them in. Oh. These are important comparisons. These are important comparisons, brethren. Higher taxes. Lower taxes on Trump. Higher taxes on Biden. Hmm. How does that work? Think it through. Think it through. Where would more money be found in the pockets of who? If you had Trump versus Biden. Well, it'd be in your pocket with Trump, more money in your pocket. And what would that do? That would probably give you more disposable cash to buy more goods, which would generate more taxes. You don't need to raise taxes. The spending would raise the taxes. <laughs> the spending would raise the taxes. It's simple. 
Simple economics. Policy. I don't care if it was Trump. I don't care if it was Mr. Kangaroo. You know, I, I don't care who it was. The policy is most important, brethren. Think. Think. Forget about Republican. Forget about Democrat. Forget about independent. Forget about labor parties. Forget about all that. Forget about it. Policy. 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 That's what we need to think about. And we need to be courageous in these end times. Because things are changing, brethren. And if we don't act and become engaged, we will indeed lose what we have. Because there are people that want to take everything you have away from you and leave you with very minimal opportunity to act freely because they think they can think for you better than you can think for yourself. They think you need government to tell you what to do so that you don't hurt yourself. They don't have the respect for your own intelligence that you can make your own decisions and take care of yourself without any problem. So, brethren, may God give us the guidance and the courage to accept the outcomes that are positioned in the very near future, because they are positioned to disclose and reveal some very, very interesting events through the declassification of more material. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming declassification of additional documents which will reveal how things got to where they are today will indeed, indeed be made more public. As they do become more public, brethren, pray for our country and be strong. Speak unashamedly. Speak unashamedly about the gospel and, brethren, the corruption we face and pray to God that He will continue to show favor on this country so that we might continue the work of Jesus Christ.